Welcome to Season 5 of Purposeful Empathy, a show dedicated to amplifying the voices of people from around the globe who understand that the world needs more empathy and are doing something about it. Today's episode was brought to you by Grant Huron International, an on-demand coaching provider for individuals and companies. Thanks for watching the show. Enjoy. So welcome to a new episode of Purposeful Empathy. Today I'm joined by Tony Blumeris in South Africa. Uh, she is a psychologist, a consciousness coach, a qualitative market researcher living her purpose, which is to bring compassion to humanity. Her tool is empathy, and that's why she calls herself an empathy change maker. Her vehicle to her vision is a social enterprise with three core services. The first is to measure through research social impact. The second is organizational learning and professional development. And the third, more recently, is digital design. The goal is to help grow micro, small, and medium enterprises in South Africa, as well as empower citizen leadership in underprivileged rural communities. It's great to have you on the show. Welcome, Tony. Thank you very much, Anita. It's great to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Brilliant. Now, we don't even know each other, right? We connected on LinkedIn, but we're both doing some empathy work and we just felt a strong connection to go into this phone call cold. So here we are. And <laughs> Thank uh, you. right. And so I guess I want to ask, you know, was there something in your life, some pivotal moment in which, you know, all your work around purpose and empathy was seated? There is. I obviously didn't realize it at the time. I was 14 years old and I was driving with my mother into the busy CBD of Durban in South Africa. And I looked around, you know, at all these cars, loads of cars, people driving in their cars and people were like really glum, really lifeless, not much energy. And I said to my mom, where are all these people going? And she said, they're going to work. So I said, but mom, they all look so unhappy. And she said, well, yeah, work often isn't a happy place. And something in that moment just felt, you know, that whole assessment and evaluation just felt wrong to me. And when I have in turn found myself in organizations and I look back now, I can absolutely understand, you know, the the lack of engagement that I was seeing, because that was often my experience in big corporate environments. So that's really, I think, where it took place was just this realization that life should be about so much more. And I guess I have really have made it a, 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 an absolute mission to love what I do and not to do it purely for the money. Um, cause when that is the case, I, I don't feel fulfilled at all. And I, you know, then I've got to really find a purpose to get up in the morning and go to work. Yeah. So if, well, that's amazing at 14 years old that you, you know, you had that strike of consciousness to see other people and say, okay, I want something better for myself. So what did that look like? So, you know, you've had a career, um what what journey have you been on tell us a little bit about your path oh my gosh I've had a few careers um my very first actually my very very first job was weighing tea when I was about seven years old for my grandfather he was in the tea business but that wasn't a career um obviously <laughs> so I my first career was as a fashion model and I modeled extensively, was on both sides of the camera, both sides of the ramp, both in styling, in modeling, in organizing fashion shows. Um, that was about 18 odd, 18, 19 years. So that started when I was 14. At 14, I would have been driving with my mum into a fashion shoot in Bunking School. So that was career number one, which then overlapped with career number two, which was psychology. I studied to be a psychologist and I practiced for numerous years whilst modeling on the side. And I then went into marketing, brand management, and I finally ended up in qualitative market research. And that's where I really found my home. But the love of working directly with people 
really started to speak to me again about seven or eight years ago. And that's when I left a, a full-time position. It was a good position, but I left it to follow this inner urging that I could feel. Something was pulling me. And um, I decided to take the risk and go with the pull. And that's where the first empathy program was born. So tell me about that. So I think it comes through, it started in the space of personal development, which has always been a passion of mine. Um, Self-development has always been a passion. And obviously that's what led into, into psychology. And I started to pick up on tools and things that really worked for me. And I built what I call the 5A empathy model. And so that it's just a process of using visualizations, intentions, awareness building, um, mindfulness, acknowledgement, accountability. And it's a circle. It's a circular, it's a circular tool which has one or two exercises to each section that people can do in the course of a day. It doesn't take more than about 15 minutes over the course of a day to do. And gradually through that self-awareness, you start to identify certain behaviors that you want to tweak or shift or new habits that you want to be drawn into and that you want to practice. And so goes the spiral. So it, it, it starts an upward, spiral, it, an upward spiral curve of personal growth and development. And it can be plugged in to a call center. It can be plugged into staff with an MPO. It can work with a team of people. But the beauty of it is that it really does start in that self-awareness space. And what is the in connection to empathy? Ending. What's the connection to empathy? Well, I think perhaps the question there is how do I define empathy? Okay. And there are so many, you know, there's so many different ways of looking at it. And to be absolutely honest with you, I don't think I could really, I think my definition of, of empathy has shifted and changed. And it's actually taken on a radical change in the last 18 months. Mm. I look at empathy as a skill set mm. with a host of behaviors or perspectives or a particular mindset. Mm -hmm. And so to say that it is a characteristic, yes, someone can be described as, oh, she's highly empathetic. Mm -hmm. But how to train it? I don't think empathy is a thing and I don't think empathy is a behavior. It's a whole bunch of stuff that is rooted in self and rooted in other. And for many years, I only rooted it in other. And I do think that's one of the reasons why the program went dormant for a while, is that I, it worked, it worked great, but the focus was, though it started with self-awareness, learning to become aware of yourself so that you could, might recognize something of yourself in another person's um, behavior or perspective, it was a much bigger piece that was missing. So for me, when an organization, when the culture of an organization is experienced to be compassionate, you know, one in which you feel like you're included and you belong and you can be honest and you can be vulnerable and you can bring your whole self to work, not leave half yourself out the door. You know, that kind of feeling, when you dig underneath it, what is the skill set? It's empathy. So I look at, 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 at compassion being the perhaps output or the, the atmosphere you want to create through these different, um, different skills that all together for me make up what is empathy. So you work with organizations to kind of create cultures of empathy through your five yeah. piece model. Yeah. Um, I, to, okay, I know this is going to be a question that I feel I have also an answer to, and I wouldn't be able to guess what you might answer, but I'll ask it anyways. I think <laughs> Let's brainstorm asking, it. Why is this needed now more than ever? 
Mm, that's such a big question and it's such a hugely important question. You know, speaking from a South African perspective, because we're going to get to get a different measure of this around the globe. But I think what, what empathy and what compassion do is they raise the level of consciousness of an organization. So for me, when you get right into the back end of it, it is about raising consciousness. What is consciousness? You know, for me, I would explain it as a kind of mindset, a beingness that you embody, maybe consciously or not consciously. But what I see so much of, and I feel so much of in South Africa, because we are steeped in our historic um, roots of apartheid, is a very strong poverty mindset. Mm. And by that, I say it's a mindset mm. of lack. Now, this is what we see in so many organizations. We've got to drive the deadline. We've got to drive people's performance. We've got to drive productivity. Because, you know, there's, you know, there's just not enough resources to go around and there's just not enough time and there's just not enough money. We live from a place and we, we're schooled in it. We're steeped in it from a place of lack. And for me, the, the opposite of that is a mindset of abundance. I am enough. I have enough. I will always have enough. My needs are cared for. So that is... Really, I guess my, you know, the I will know one day that I've achieved my purpose when I can say that the impact of the work I've ha I've done has helped someone or a community or a school or a business to shift. You know, back to your organizational question to shift from we are not enough, or this organization is not enough, or the culture is not enough, to one where it is enough. Because when we are enough, I can show up to work with my whole self. I can come wholeheartedly, heart open. Mm. But when I'm walking into a culture where there is such a drive, because fundamentally it's driven by leadership at the top, who are also steeped in our traditional past of there's not enough to go around. So we've got to drive harder, push harder, be the best. Mm. You know, being the best always supposes some kind of competition where there's going to be a winner and a loser. So it's about saying, why do we have to have winners and losers? Why are we not all, you know, able to show up in that space of being enough? So let me ask a critical question, because what comes up for me is, you know, earlier when I was introducing you, you were saying that you are really keen to empower citizen leadership in underprivileged rural communities. Mm -hmm. And so what flashes in my mind as an image of an underprivileged rural community is lack of resources in a lot. It's probably it's not lack of potential. That's for sure. It's lack of resources. Absolutely not. And so how would you respond to a question where it's like, how can you say to anyone who fundamentally lacks resources, right, um, that, that they should have a, a, a mindset of abundance? How do you reconcile that? Many of, I think many of us, whether we have been born into impoverished communities or into well-to-do communities, um, many of us can still have the same poverty mindset. Mm. Um, it's what will drive the someone who might have a really a lot of money to still continue to make. Um, because I might run out or it might be taken away. Um, so it's coming from a similar place, even though the environmental factors may look different. Now, in a in a what we would you know see as a community that doesn't have a lot of a lot of resources, is one of the fundamental issues is is often that you know somebody will adopt that community, and say okay great we're going to come in and we're going to provide resources, and it comes back to that story of give a man a fish, or teach him how to fish, the teaching how to fish empowers somebody to then be able to go and catch their own fish. 
as opposed to becoming used to being given all resources. And inherent in that is the, the, the tipping point of the switch to be able to look around, but yet have someone guide you into that space of really understanding, really feeling and really touching that sense of possibility that lies within me. Mm. And that is our human birthright, mm. all humans. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Nobody is, birth, is born without that birthright. But if you've grown up in an environment where there's many NGOs that come to take care of your resources and people bringing the resources in, then in a way, whilst that helps at one level, what happens when the funding to that MPO's pro program collapses? The MPO pulls out and the, the community it has not been empowered to keep that resource building or generation going. Mm. So the community leadership angle is about working with pivotal people in the community who have a wide circle of, audio, uh, uh, circle of influence. It's about working with that leader. It's about guiding that leader, coaching that leader to really touch, feel, and learn to express their potential and their possibility. And for that to become so infectious that they then, so let's take a school principal, for example. Now let's take a picture, school, real example. School principal, principal with about 55 kids in her school. The school is so neglected that there are no doors. There's no glass on the windows. The roofs are cracked and leaking. And this is 40 kilometers from me. Okay, so this is real. And those kids come to school every day, rain or shine, because they have a principal who's deeply passionate to try and turn things around. But she's given a pittance from government every month to keep that maintenance going. And they'll choose to use that money very wisely rather to perhaps get an extra teacher. So now what happens day like today, it's rainy, it's cold, and those kids are sitting at school and they are freezing. Now, when that principal touches her potential and her possibility, and she then influences that same self-discovery amongst her teachers, because she now sees in them possibility as opposed to scarcity. She sees possibility, so that passion, it moves out into the educator group. That passion then moves through to the school governing body as it does to the management team of the school. And slowly it filters out to the kids. So it's through that awakening in someone of their own passion and um, their own possibility that, and that's where the empathy comes, comes in. Because if I see it in you, you then recognize it in me. And therein lies the connection of empathy and so builds a compassionate relationship. Now imagine that one principal then can influence 55 kids. Those 55 kids then go back into the community to their families and to their parents who notice a different. The parents come back into school, hey, what's going on here? They are also then into that, that beautiful influential energy field of possibility. And then the light bulbs start going off. And then we see there's some extra water there. I can plant a little garden there. We can grow veggies for our kids. We can bring the community in. Hey, anyone in this community, maybe there's someone who can fix a door or fix the roof. So that's a more sustainable route to rather having a program coming in to supply all the resources. And, and we've seen amazing, we've seen amazing, there's some amazing case studies in SA, you know, like take a school in the middle of a crime ridden area and five years on, nobody takes the equipment out of the school anymore mm -hmm. because the community has started to become generative mm -hmm. and they're starting to see possibility and they see the school at the hub of that. Hmm. So imagine that as a ripple field of empathy and compassion. And in so doing, you really start to uplift 
communities who then believe that they are enough. Mm. Mm. I have a mentor who's passed on and uh, he taught me something you know, I, I grew up with grandparents that, that died when I was a young kid. So I didn't have like an older generation to turn to. And I actually, I think as a result, felt that older people, um, unfortunately, this is very kind of, I don't, I don't care to admit it, but et voila. Um, I felt that they were kind of irrelevant. Like they, you know, didn't have much to offer. How wrong I was until I met Jim Godber. Uh, and I met him when he was 74. He was celebrating his 50th class reunion at McGill. I was working in alumni relations and I sat next to him at this like, you know, lunch with a thousand people where everybody was coming back to the university to celebrate milestone reunions. And I thought, oh, okay, what kind of conversation am I gonna have with this gentleman? And he was a riot, oh my gosh. He told me story after story after story. And, and we, he became like a, a revered uncle slash grandfather for more than a decade. And one of the things that he taught me whenever I was kind of running into my own um, limiting beliefs or doubt, or, you know, when you, pref not to, there's a special word when you, you, you feel like you are going to be found out. I can't remember what the word is. Um, imposter syndrome. Exposed. Yeah. And he used to say to me, you are better than you think you are. And that doesn't mean you're better than anyone else. You are better than you think you are. So in all my classes now at McGill, I take the word, the letters of you are better than you think you are. And I jumble them up and it's just a set of letters on a slide. It's the first slide I show. And I give the students one minute in class to try to decode it. It's an impossible task in a minute. And then I put the second slide up as you are better than you think you are. And it took me many years before I got to the point where I could live in the cheesiness of it. But now what I actually do is I literally walk around to every student on the first day of class and I say, you are better than you think you are. You are better than you think you are. And you are better than you think you are. And then I do the same thing at the end of the semester. And it's amazing how soft their faces get when they accept that, you know, that, that offering. And it's so powerful if we give each other permission to be all that we can be. And I think that's exactly what you're, what you're describing. So I really appreciate it. Yeah. yeah. They say that, you know, in, in, in our world of scarcity, you'll hear five criticisms for one before you'll get one statement of acknowledgement and praise. Now, if we turn that around rather and do five of the encouragements and praises and acknowledgements and appreciations, and only one you know, of the more critical, that that alone is so powerful because it helps somebody to really recognize their, their, their blessings and their, their, their natural gifts and actually what they contribute. Mm -hmm. I think that's the big thing is that we all, all of us, every single person has got something amazing to contribute. Mm -hmm. But we think it only matters if it's something really big or something very impactful. Mm -hmm. But in fact, you know, how often is it really the case, as cheesy as it sounds, that when somebody gives you that really heartwarming smile, just because you showed up in their world, it could be an absolute stranger, it literally changes the energetic exchange. And it, it you know what I mean? It, it draws you together in relationship, even if, you know, even if you don't know them at all. So you know what you bring up is I, I listened to a, um, a conversation on like a podcast like we're doing right now. And the, the guest speaker was a medical doctor who actually studies near-death experiences. And he's interviewed hundreds of people around the world. And they, they all have kind of similar experiences to share that kind of mm -hmm. fall these uh, typical categories of the near-death experience. And one of them is the life flashing before your eyes, but it's not the big things like, oh, getting my graduation from high school and then my first job and then when I fell in love and then when I got married and when I had my first kid, it's nothing like that. They talk about revisiting moments in their life where the kindness of a stranger given, you know, and they receive the kindness or when they've acted in some kind or generous way, but on such a little minutia level, all of those get replayed out. And I found that super like goosebump inducing. So I think that's what you're just saying there too. Um, 
I want to ask about the social enterprise because you talk about these three, you know, uh, pathways where you deploy empathy. First one being research. So can you tell yeah. us what research, qualitative research is all about and how empathy plays in that? So, you know, research has made kind of three arms, really, I guess. You've got the quantitative side, which is all your measurements, stats, et cetera. You've got the qualitative side, which I describe in a marketing research perspective as almost like psychology of consumer behavior in a way. But I mean, we, we as qualitative researchers will really seek to understand what has built a set of stats to look like this? What is the backstory to this? And where is it going? So the qualitative research will take, you know, take data and, and, and ground it in both historical and current context, therefore will give you some kind of insight as to what is coming next. And whether it's in market research or social research, it really doesn't, doesn't matter. Research is about getting information and then understanding the meaning of that information and allowing you to do something meaningful with it. Can you give me? An I mean, otherwise, why do we need it? Can you give me an example? Um, let me think of. Okay, so let's take let's take an empathy program for instance. Okay, so we would start in a school. I'm going to use that because that's that's real on the table at the moment, and do a culture climate survey. A culture. Okay, so we're going to set culture climate. Culture. So what is the climate of the culture? Sure. Um, what's working in the culture? What's not? How does it feel like? Uh, what are some behaviors that are evident that point to certain characteristics that either work or don't work? And that would mainly be done, you know, if it's a very small organization, we just literally hold qualitative in-depth discussions. It might happen in a group. It might happen one-on-one, -on -one, depends, on depends on the context and the size. If it's a large organization, we'll take the qualitative insights and translate that into a survey, a quantitative survey, then administer that to the entire organization and get measures on the, the, the softer qualitative aspects that we, we saw coming up in our, in our interviews. Based on that, and in the, in the school place, we would then, we would look at it and frame it into a, a measure of EQ. So I would say that for us, EQ is almost the measure of the level of empathy within the school. Mm -hmm. um, so it's built on a number of a number of different factors. So that would be both qualitative and quantitative research working to set up a benchmark, an EQ benchmark. Then you run the empathy training program. And because for me, empathy is a, a set of behaviors or a skill set of behaviors, you're looking at shifting behavior. Now we all know that doesn't happen overnight. You know, what's the, they, they normally say 21 days. I would go so far as say 21 plus another 21. So 21 for awareness, another 21 to start putting some roots down and another 21 for those roots to wrap around that rock and grab on tight. And at that point, maybe your friends and family are gonna say, you know, you just seem a whole lot calmer lately. Then you know, okay, feedback from others, mm -hmm. something's rooted. Mm -hmm. And that, so the empathy training program runs in very small bites once a week for two to three months. Mm -hmm. So it's quite a heavy investment from a, a setup perspective, but I don't quite get how people can do empathy training in two days yeah. and expect to see a massive shift. Um, you know, behavior change, it takes time and it takes patience and it takes gentleness. It takes awareness and it takes starting to bring a new language into the environment, which then can happen over time. And depending on the size of the organization, I mean, the group of educators I'll be working with is relatively small. So we can do it once a week as a group, COVID permitting. Um, but we can also do it online. But it is tricky when you're working with a more rural school who doesn't have access to Wi-Fi and the educators themselves might not have Wi-Fi at home. So that's when it is done, best done in, in person. And then six months later, you set a time, six months later, we'll go in and run the same EQ measure and have a look at 
at, at, at what has shifted. But certainly a shift of one point on an empathy scale will translate to higher engagement, higher return on investment. And that is the beauty of it. When you think of big corporates, can you imagine the power and the shift in an organization, you know, drive engagement, drive commitment. It, it really is a win-win. It is a win-win because as I was saying with a, or a friend of mine who talks a lot about flourishing, she's like, wouldn't you want an organization where everyone's flourishing? <laughs> wouldn't you want an organization where everyone is kinder um, and more engaged and more productive? So Tony, thank you so much for, for sharing everything um, that you have so far. I have a final question that I love to ask my podcast guests. And that is, can you think of a time in your life when you were on the receiving end of empathy or what I call purposeful empathy, empathy quite on purpose um, and what that meant for you? Mm. Um, it was around about mid-February this year. I've been on a, an, on a very deep personal exploration for the last 18 months. And it's been a really quite a painful personal process. And as new awareness has come up for me, so has a lot of pain. And right kind of where this, I was in the thick of it. And I really was feeling very bleak, very depressed. And to be honest, uh, mm -hmm. on cue, on cue. <laughs> on cue. Um, I was feeling suicidal. I mean, I re it really was, I, I was really, it really was deep. And it was a Friday afternoon where I literally had what my therapist called an emotional cathartic breakdown where so much pain was coming through and up and through my body. I really actually didn't know what to do with it. I, you know, and you, you feel like you're going to explode, but this is an explosion of years and years in a childhood of repressed pain and emotion. Finally coming up to the four, you know, when you're like 52. <laughs> and I reached out I knew I couldn't be alone. And I reached out to a bunch of people and nobody was answering their phone. And I, 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 was, I was beside myself. And then I found a friend who literally held space from at two, the first one on the phone. And then when she had to go, I called a friend who lives on the same estate with me. And all I had to say was, come now. And this person arrived and just held space for an hour and a half while I let out all this pain. Didn't try to change the scenario, could see exactly what I needed. Um, I needed no coaching. I just needed the strong beingness of somebody's unjudgmental presence to hold me. And it was the most compassionate hour and a half whilst I could just completely 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 let go I would have hated to have known <laughs> what I actually looked like at the end of that hour and a half but you know it really didn't matter you know how special it is to be able to completely fall apart and know that there is no judgment coming back from the other side Mm -hmm. That for me was one of the most pivotal, empathetic holding spaces. It was almost like, I know this might sound bizarre, but like a, a, a womb of rebirth. Mm -hmm. yeah. And through that, I have started to not only, I had found my voice, but I've now started to use it. And it is in the using that I am now able to create from a sense of healing and wholeheartedness. And there's still healing going on, but I really do feel like my heart is open. Mm -hmm. And I don't need to hide because in those moments, I was so seen. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for sharing that, Tony. I could see as your eyes were watering what an impact uh, your friends mm -hmm. made for you. And it's, it's a constant reminder to me as I ask the question of my guests, how important empathy is 
and how available it is if we would just reach for it. So with that, I just want to thank you so much for being a guest. And, and thank you so much for inviting me. It's been wonderful to talk to you, Anita. Thank you very much. Same. And thanks You're for doing great me. work. <laughs> thank you. Thanks Empathy for and purpose. <laughs> thanks to all our viewers and watchers. We'll see you next week at Purpose Blend. What if you had access to your own council of coaches to help you break free from your thinking clutter, or make an important decision, or liberate you from whatever's holding you back? At Grant here in International, you get to choose the coach of your choice from any place, any time. Visit GrantHeronInternational.com and harness the power of on-demand coaching today.